I am delighted to share with you uh, what is uh, my life's work. So uh, sin since I, I finished my PhD, I've been um, chasing in one form or other uh, the psychology of confidence, trying to understand the circumstances under which people are overconfident and some of the risks that that exposes all of us to. If you read the self-help literature, you could easily come away with the impression that more confidence is better. That your challenge in life is to bolster your confidence, to prove the haters wrong, and to believe in yourself. Um, if there is one book that has made this case most fabulously, it may be The Secret, which uh, presents the notion that if you only believe hard enough and truly deeply enough that you can make anything come true that you wish. Here's a, a brief clip from the movie made based on the book, The Secret. So now you start to have different beliefs, like there is more than enough in the universe. Or you have the belief that everything goes right for me. Or you have the belief that I'm not getting older, I'm getting younger. We can create it the way we want it, by using the law of attraction. Oh, uh, the law of attraction is the principle that you attract into your life that which you uh, believe most fervently. So now you start to have different beliefs, like there is more than enough in the universe. Or you have the belief that everything goes right for me. Or you have the belief that I'm not getting older, I'm getting younger. We can create it the way we want it, by using the law of attraction. And you can break yourself free from your hereditary patterns, cultural codes, social beliefs, and prove once and for all that the power within you is greater than the power that's in the world. Some of you may be thinking, well, that's very nice, but I can't do that, or she won't let me do that, or he'll never let me do that, or I haven't got enough money to do that, or I'm not strong enough to do that, or I'm not rich enough to do that, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. Every single I'm not is a creation. Are there any limits to this? Absolutely not. We are unlimited beings. We have no ceiling. The capabilities and the talents and the gifts and the power that is within every single individual on this planet is unlimited. That is an inspiring message. <laughs> Let's think a little bit about limits. Let me invite you to estimate some uncertain quantities. The first of this is the percentage of UC Berkeley's budget that is covered by state support. So this is an important figure for the university. Um, you have some guess about what this is. <laughs> Shh. <laughs> Don't look it up. <laughs> um, what I'm looking for for this and the next series of uh, quantities I'm going to ask you to guess is a confidence interval. Confidence intervals are useful in all sorts of personal and professional settings. It's rare that your family members invite you to specify confidence intervals, but maybe at your job you've been invited to specify a confidence interval around some guess. You're estimating wind shear and the force that'll apply to a new building you're putting up. You're estimating product sales for some new product you're going to introduce. What's your confidence interval on that estimate? And what does it mean for your planning in uh, reinforcing your building or productive capacity for your new product? That confidence interval is very informative for uh, influencing decisions and hedging risk associated with uncertainty in the future. So how sure are you? You got some guess about this, maybe thanks to the people who shouted it out. Uh, but maybe you're not so sure, maybe you didn't quite hear. Give me a confidence interval in your head. Uh, that would be a number below your best guess and a number above your best guess. If this is your best guess, here, the confidence interval would be a range below it and above it such that you're 90% sure the right answer is inside that interval. 
Okay, when you've got that in your head for this quantity, you can test whether the right answer was inside it. How many of you got the right answer inside your confidence interval? Okay, let's try another one. The percentage of Cal's budget from state support in 1989. Please don't shout it out <laughs> if you know. Again, reflect on how sure you think you can be. How accurate is your knowledge on this? The challenge again is to specify a confidence interval, a number below and above your best guess, that interval being wide enough that you're 90% sure the right answer is inside it. Once you've got that, for item two, I'll share with you the answer, 50%. How many of you had that number inside your confidence interval? Okay. Number three, number of living alumni from the Haas School. Undergrad, MBA, PhD. This is the number of living alumni worldwide. Come on in, there's still seats. Once you got your 90% confidence interval on that, then you're ready for me to share with you the answer, 40,766. How many of you had that one inside your confidence interval? Hmm. Somewhat less than 90%. Uh, number four, number of countries that host Haas alumni. Where do we live? All over the world. Take your guess. Again, I'm not so much interested in your point estimate as your confidence interval. In your head, think of the number below and above your best guess such that you make that wide enough that you're 90% sure the right answer is inside. When you've got it, you're ready for the answer, 96. How many of you had that one? Okay, and the last one. Number of friends Berkeley Haas has on Facebook. <laughs> when you've got your 90% confidence interval, you're ready for the answer, 50,366. How many of you had that one inside your confidence? Oh. Oh, not sure we're getting better. So less than 90% of the hands in here went up for each of these. What gives? Uh-huh, uh-huh. So some of you, seeing that you are hitting less than 90% expanded, you can of course go from zero to infinity and be fairly confident you're gonna get the right answer in there. Mm, that's less useful. If your company asks you how many widgets you're gonna sell next quarter and you say somewhere between zero and infinity, they'll ask someone else. <laughs> so why were you hitting less than 90%? Lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge obviously plays in here. So when you don't, when you don't have a great sense, so if the question is um, on what day were you born, you can make the estimate with a great deal of certainty. Lack of knowledge is relevant. It should mean that you're not very certain. It should also mean you make your confidence interval wider. To the extent that you're aware that you lack the relevant knowledge for making an informed estimate, it should widen your confidence interval. Studies that examine the effect of knowledge on confidence intervals show that yes indeed, as people know more, as the topic gets closer to their area of expertise, their confidence intervals shrink. The bad news is they shrink roughly in proportion to the accuracy of their knowledge, so their hit rates don't go up. It is common for hit rates inside 90% confidence intervals to hover around 50%. I think you did a little bit better than that in here, but not a lot. So ignorance by itself isn't an explanation. What else is going on? <laughs> Say it louder. Indeed. The confidence interval task reveals overprecision in judgment. That is, we act as if we're more sure than we deserve to be, that we know the right answer. Academics not usually prone to exaggeration have said some pretty grandiose things about the research on overconfidence. Richard Thaler, recent winner of the Nobel Prize in Economics, pictured here with his colleague Werner de Bont, wrote in 1995 on what is one of the most seminal papers in behavioral finance. 
that perhaps the most robust finding in the psychology of judgment is that people are overconfident. Griffin and Vary wrote that overconfidence is not only marked but nearly universal. And Scott Plowson, his 1993 textbook on decision making, where he blamed it for the loss of space shuttles Challenger in Columbia, the Chernobyl nuclear accident, and many other tragedies, wrote that no problem in judgment and decision making is more prevalent and more potentially catastrophic than overconfidence. So how have psychologists studied overconfidence? Overestimation is thinking that you're better than you actually are. Overplacement is the exaggerated belief that you're better than others. The size of these pie pieces roughly represent their uh, frequency in the research literature. And overprecision is the excessive faith that you know the truth. A few examples of each of these is in order. So people tend to overestimate the speed at which they will get work done. If um, you're like me, this shows up on a to-do list of commitments that exceeds the hours in the day. Um, and I struggle to get done everything that I thought I had time for back when I accepted the assignment. Government planners tend to overestimate the speed and underestimate the expense of new public works projects. We have a lot of data on big government infrastructure projects. There's less publicly available data on corporate development projects. But my guess is few of you have ever heard of a software development project that came in ahead of schedule and under budget. All of us tend to behave as if we have more control than we actually have. And I'll share with you this example just because it's so charming. This is someone who clearly has a very high estimation of his control and in this circumstance appears to have overestimated it. Overplacement is the exaggerated belief that we're better than others. And the most cited finding in this research literature is Ola Svensson's 1981 paper showing that 93% of American drivers believe that they're better than the median. It doesn't work out statistically. Uh, Cameron Lavallo argued that if potential entrepreneurs make this mistake, it could help account for the high level of entry, intense competition, and high rates of failure we see in so many industries. By some estimates, 80% of new companies are out of business within five years. And if you ask professional engineers, and sadly, yes, even college professors on average, they report themselves being better than average. There are circumstances in which you could imagine this sort of self-confidence being a self-fulfilling prophecy. I would just note that there are at least some circumstances when it is, in fact, a self-negating prophecy. So sad. The third variety of overconfidence that I want to talk about today is overprecision, the excessive faith that you know the truth. Why precision? Think of the 90% confidence interval task. Our subjective probability distributions are too tight. We imagine that our information, our knowledge, is more certain, more accurate than it actually is. 90% confidence intervals routinely include the truth less than 50% of the time. When clinical psychologists and physicians make this mistake, they will gravitate toward a favored diagnosis too quickly. People tend to be excessively sure of their predictions regarding how others will behave when forecasters at the CIA or inside your company make this mistake. You will hedge too little against an uncertain future and proceed as if you know when you don't. Overprecision has been offered as an explanation for the high rate of trading in the stock market by my colleague here at Haas, Terry O'Dean, who notes that in um, neoclassical economic theory, there should be no trading if all stock market participants are perfectly rational and know that others are perfectly rational. <laughs> On the other hand, if stock market participants are too sure that they have correctly valued the assets or equities being traded, they will be too willing to trade with others who have different valuations than they do. It is common for us to be willing to put pretty high stakes on our own accuracy. This is research from uh, Brooke Fischoff, a, a former colleague of mine, who examined the published literature for 
confidence intervals to ask whether scientists got it right. So you may have thought, ah, I don't have much experience with confidence intervals, and I don't have much incentive to get this right. So these, each dot here is a published estimate of the speed of light. These are high stakes claims. Scientists stake their reputations on these reports. Each published estimate comes with a confidence interval. The scientists who published these papers knew their estimates were imperfect. How imperfect were they? Well, these are 98% confidence intervals. Based on the uncertainties reported in these scientific publications, you can estimate a confidence interval around the point estimate. Less than 98% of these overlap with what we now believe the true value to be for the speed of light. These are estimates of the speed of light. You find similar patterns for the inverse fine structure constant, Planck's constant, and electrons charge, electrons mass, and Avogadro's number. Published estimates overlap with the truth less than the uncertainties published with them imply that they should. So this got me thinking a lot about the problem of leadership. I just uh, had the privilege of teaching the first year MBAs, uh, the Leading People core class, in which we talk a lot about leadership and the pressures present on those contending for positions of leadership. It's easy to imagine that in lots of settings, perhaps even scientific publications, there's social incentives, market incentives, or public expectations that lead those who want to be influential to claim more confidence than the facts say they should have. In particular, I think we have reason to worry about this in the political realm. If politicians think they can get away with making claims that they aren't necessarily held accountable for. And this, of course, has some predictable consequences in who gets elected. Nobody can do it like me. Nobody. Nobody can do it like me. Honestly. Nobody's stronger than me. Nobody has better toys than I do. There's nobody bigger or better at the military than I am. Nobody loves the Bible more than I do. Nobody builds walls better than me. Nobody's better to people with disabilities than me. Nobody's fighting for the veterans like I'm fighting for the veterans. There's nobody that's done so much for equality as I have. There's nobody more pro-Israel than I am. There's nobody more conservative than me. There is nobody that respects women more than I do. Nobody would be tougher on ISIS than Donald Trump. Nobody's ever had crowds like Trump has had. There's nobody that understands the horror of nuclear better than me. I mean, nobody even understands it but me. It's called devaluation. The sale of the uranium that nobody knows what it means. I know what it means. Nobody knows more about trade than me. Nobody knows the game better than I do. Nobody in the history of this country has ever known so much about infrastructure as Donald Trump. I know the H-1B, I know the H-2B, nobody knows it better than me. Nobody knows politicians better than I do. Nobody knows more about taxes than I do. Nobody knows more about debt than I do. Nobody knows the system better than me. Which is why I alone can fix it. Yeah, still waiting on that. Uh, it, <laughs> you applauding for him? Um, if you think, well, it seems to be working out OK, uh, I would just note that there are lots of circumstances in life when it pays to be well calibrated. If you're this guy, it is very helpful to know whether you're going to make it across the crevasse before you jump. And definitely, if you're this guy, you want to know whether he's going to make it across. It is also the case that there are institutions, companies, and products positioned to exploit your errors in confidence. I was amused to find this, com this uh, report commissioned by the National Lottery of the United Kingdom on optimism. If you're going to sell your customers negative expected value bets, you would like them to continue to be optimistic about their chances of winning. Um, in an attempt to help my students calibrate their confidence judgments, I give them unconventional tests. 
Uh, I am amazed that having just endured my final exam a couple of days ago, um, one of my students actually made it here. Let me salute your courage, Merch. Thank you. Um, when I um, give my students uh, the exam in my class, I ask on multiple, the multiple choice items, not only which item do you think is right, but how sure are you? So for each of the given options, how confident are you that each of these is the right answer? When my students tell me they're 100% sure that they have correctly identified the right answer, they are in fact right only 89% of the time. When they give confidence numbers in the range 90 to 99%, most of those are 90s, so it, on average it comes out to 93% confident, they're right about 76% of the time. Confidence exceeds accuracy across the range. Um, some of my economist colleagues, upon seeing results like this, say, ah, students, they don't have that much at stake in this. If only the stakes were higher, people could solve this problem. So I went in search of a context where the stakes were higher, and I found this. The million dollar money drop was a game show that ran for several seasons in the US and the UK and some other countries around the world. At the beginning of the game, contestants started with a million dollars. This million dollars, as of right now, is yours. Wow! Oh my god! Oh my god! The question is, how long can you hang on to it? In order to do that, you're going to have to give us the correct answers to seven multiple choice questions. Each of these four drops will represent a possible answer to those questions, only one of which is the correct answer. Now, the rules are very simple. You must risk all of your money on every single question. But if you're not certain of the answer, you can play it safe and place your money on more than one drop. However, you must always leave one drop clear. Put your money on the wrong answer, and it drops. It's gone forever. Whatever money you have left over at the end of the seven questions is yours to keep. Are you ready? Yeah! All right. You've got one million dollars. I've got seven questions. Let's play the million dollar money drop. Sports equipment, Tom Hanks films. Talk it over. I know a lot about sports equipment. How many Tom Hanks movies do you know of? Sports equipment. I want sports equipment. We're going to go for sports equipment. Sports, sports equipment? equipment? Yes. Yeah. All right. Sports equipment. This is all on him, though. All on him. No pressure. The four possible answers are A, NBA basketball. B, NFL football. C, MLB baseball. And D, NHL hockey puck. Balls, but a puck. And the question is. Which of these is the heaviest? Talk it over. Okay, I am going to rule out basketball. Yes. Yeah, I would say it's the biggest. It's the most obvious answer. I've never felt a hockey puck. Have you? I have not felt a hockey puck. I would puck, say, but it my smashes gut, things. My gut is a hockey puck. Sixty seconds on the I clock, and it's moving, moving now. Our money okay. is a hockey puck. Um, All right, let's step up and see what drops. <laughs> Which of these is the heaviest? If it's A or B, we're done. If it's C, Major League Baseball, you've got $400,000 going into question three. And if it's the hockey puck, you've got $600,000 into question three. Good luck. saying this is all on you, then she rules out basketball. Uh, if you look across <laughs> all rounds and seasons of the million dollar money drop, when contestants put 100% of their money on one of the options, they are in fact right only 83% of the time. And like my wise and well calibrated students in class, confidence exceeds accuracy across the range. What are the implications of this? of being too certain that we're right is that we forecast badly. My fascination with forecasting 
and the ways in which overconfidence can complicate it got me involved in what was the most um, ambitious research project of my career. Some of you may have read about it uh, in the work of former Haas professor Phil Tetlock. He wrote a book called Super Forecasting that described our work with the Intelligence Advanced Research Projects activity where we were trying to help them forecast geopolitical events. Corporations care about forecasting, of course. Whenever they're trying to plan for an uncertain future, much of which involves customer demand, how much will my product sell? The German multinational BASF came to me in my lab to ask for help forecasting. They were aware of the imperfections in their forecasting processes and wanted help to do better. They made forecasts, like most organizations around the world, where they went to the people most familiar with the products that were their bread and butter, the commodity products that they sold in largest quantities, and asked those product managers, what is customer demand going to be next quarter? And they would base their production quantities on that. BASF had had plenty of experience with surprising outcomes where demand far outstripped their supply, and they wound up with a lot of unhappy customers. They'd also had plenty of experience where demand fell through the floor against forecasters' predictions, and they wound up with a warehouse full of surplus inventory that they couldn't sell. How could we do better? Well, first of all, it's worth admitting that that number is wrong, right? That you forecast that you're going to sell 100,000 kilograms of ibuprofen next quarter. It's not going to be 100,000 kilograms. That number, at best, comes from a distribution of possible demand numbers. So what we did with the product managers at BASF, first we asked them for their point prediction. That was 100% of forecast quantity. That was what they were used to doing. And then we followed that up by eliciting a distribution of possible beliefs. We asked them, how likely is it that the actual number will be within 10% of your point prediction. They told us, the red bar, a little less than 30% probability. That by itself is useful information. We follow that up by asking about the full range. So how likely is it that it'll be 110 to 130% all the way up to more than 170% of forecast and down to less than 30% of forecast. The blue bars indicate what actually happened. which is pretty scary. It happened way too often that demand was far less than forecast. But it isn't pure optimism in this graph. It also happened more than forecasters thought that demand outstripped their forecast by almost double or more. If you have a better sense of the distribution, so just eliciting the red bars, just eliciting the distribution from these product managers was useful and helpful information for BASF planning its production runs. If this is a product that spoils, if any extra becomes worthless if it doesn't sell, hmm, then excess production is quite costly. On the other hand, if you've got plenty of warehouse space and the product last forever, if you're manufacturing bricks, then it might not be so bad to produce extra, especially if unmet customer demand is problematic. But the distribution is useful for informing decisions, including those sorts of considerations. The point prediction does not produce enough information for you to factor in those sorts of values in considering uncertainty. But the blue bars indicate the excessive certainty among these product managers that they knew what was actually going to happen. It helps to ask people about the full distribution, but it doesn't solve the problem completely. You want your people to be well calibrated. Here's some surgeons saying, we lose a little dexterity, but we gain a lot of confidence. <laughs> it's worth questioning whether that's a good trade-off. So, how confident should you be? Um, it is not my intention today to be the Debbie Downer 
on confidence and tell you you should be less confident. There are lots of circumstances in life when confidence does enable you to achieve, when it gives you the courage to enter competitions at which you could be successful. It gives you the courage to try new things. You should be as confident as your abilities and potential justify. Par all of us parents have seen our kids be underconfident, be reluctant to try new things that they would have loved if only they'd given it a try. But they're too afraid of messing up or embarrassing themselves. Maybe it won't go well, and they don't want to do it. Many of us have had experience with the imposter syndrome, where we start some new job assignment or a new graduate program and think, Ooh, maybe I'm not cut out for this. It's really hard. And your struggles are more vividly salient to you than are the struggles of your classmates or the other people who started the job with you. And you, you'll be tempted to think, maybe I'm not good enough. In those circumstances, you need more confidence. Underconfidence is a real risk. What should you believe? You should, be belie you should believe you are as good as you are. You should believe the truth, which is not to say you are no better than your achievements. Each of us has vast, untapped potential. But to fool yourself into thinking that that potential is greater than it is opens you up to all sorts of risks. The skydivers, rock climbers, and bungee jumpers who are most confident are not those with the longest life expectancies. The students in my class who are most sure they're going to get A's and therefore don't study on the exam are not those who get the best grades. You're optimally confident when your beliefs match reality, when you understand your talents, your skills, your past performance, and your future potential. I'm sure many of you have questions about this and want to argue with me, so bring it on. <laughs> Questions? Selling advanced copies? <laughs> uh, I don't have advanced copies yet. Um, I, I uh, was able to convince Harper Business that they should uh, publish um, this story. And so uh, I just finished reviewing proofs this morning and sent it back to them. The book's in process and expected in bookstores in May. Yes, so go ahead, stand up and. and uh, Ask it into the mic, if you would. <laughs> Conveniently located, right, just hi, for you. But, uh, is there a difference in uh, um, overconfidence or confidence levels when, you, when people do studies across different parts of the world, like um, culturally? Yeah, so uh, cultural differences in, in overconfidence. Um, the picture there is confusingly complex. When researchers have taken their overconfidence tests around the world and examined cultural differences, they have sometimes found uh, differences. Uh, most notably, Frank Yates, in comparing the US and, and China, found that his Chinese respondents were more overprecise than Americans. If that uh, surprises you, um, it would. Uh, be an accurate reflection uh, of the research literature to say that the findings don't map on neatly to stereotypes about cultural differences. So um, in a study I published uh, a, a year ago um, with some um, uh, undergraduate uh, uh, research assistants uh, in my lab, um, I, parenthetically, I'll just note um, how uh, one of the many wonderful things about being at UC Berkeley is the impressive supply of motivated and talented students who sign up to do research with me. So this is one project that emerged from, from a student collaboration. Uh, um, we um, conducted tests of overconfidence uh, in the US, the UK, China, and India. Why those countries? They, um, uh, it was uh, possible for us to get large sample sizes from each of those countries. Um, and the results uh, don't fit any particularly um, uh, neat or simple picture. So our Indian participants showed more overestimation than any of the other three samples. Um, the, we failed to replicate Yates over precision comparison between the US and China. Um, I, I'm, I'm left with many questions and uh, lots of follow-up research questions that need to be asked. Yes. I haven't read your book yet, 
But what <clears throat> inhibitory elements can one employ if you are headed into the unknown, you feel pretty good about yourself, and you're willing to play the what-if game, but you don't know really how to place rational constraints upon making bad judgments. What, what inhibitory factors can you use? Thanks for your question. It's a good one. You're trying to make a, a decision with many uncertainties. Maybe you're introducing a new product that doesn't have a track record. When you do have a track record, of course, you can um, temper your confidence based on uh, prior history. When you lack that, then it becomes uh, especially important to um, question the confidence backing up your enthusiasm about this new venture. In class, I encourage my students to ask themselves why they might be wrong. And we talk about a number of psychological and organizational tools for helping do that. If you're the manager of a group or a division that's taking some risky choice, it's useful to have devil's advocates within that group. It's useful to hold a pre-mortem where you ask specifically, what are the most likely reasons that this is going to go south? How, are, how could this turn into an embarrassment? How could we fail? What are the most likely ways that that happens? And can we protect ourselves against any of those risks? It's possible that taking those risks seriously make you rethink the entire project. But it's possible you still think, this is highly uncertain, but it is a risk worth taking. And I emphatically urge my students to consider wise risk taking to undertake risks with positive expected values, even when they're scary. Because good confidence calibration is about maximizing the benefits, not just minimizing the risks. So it's possible that you still want to undertake the project even after considering the risks. A pre-mortem analysis can often be helpful in uncovering some of those risks and ensuring or hedging against them in some way or other. I'm wondering how your uh, research on uh, overconfidence might apply to the climate crisis. It seems <laughs> to me that there's a tendency to underestimate risk and over, uh, have overconfidence in that minor modifications to business as usual will do the trick. Yeah. How do you think enough can be mobilized to keep humanity in the safe spot? It is a, a good question I've thought about a lot. Um, all of us have heard um, the arguments against decisive action because the costs associated with decisive action on the climate crisis are immediate and easy to quantify, right? The imposition of a hefty carbon tax that most sensible economists think is the best way to discourage the production of carbon dioxide uh, and its uh, emission into the atmosphere. Um, that's going to have immediate predictable costs. It will impose uh, um, uh, inconveniences and um, will force uh, um, decline on some important industries. The, on the other side, the uncertainties associated with um, uh, continuing to emit as much carbon dioxide as we have been and the consequences, the global consequences of that are much less certain. Obviously those industries that um, would suffer most under the imposition of a heavy, heavy carbon tax have campaigned energetically against such decisive action and have exploited the uncertainty that remains. Um, wise decision making, however, thinks through the distribution of possible outcomes and the associated risks. Um, there have been some who have wondered whether the climate crisis could actually be an existential threat to our species. Probably not. But how big does that risk have to get to convince us that we need to take decisive action now, even if it shaves a percent or two off of GDP for a decade? Well, 1% risk of the eradication of our species? I don't know. Uh, but um, I think that there's lots of room for uh, excessive certainty, perhaps even motivated belief in the risk being lower than it is um, driving that discussion. 
One additional thought on the climate crisis, and, and that has to do with the honest representation of the difficulties associated with their solution. It is tempting for those urging action to um, uh, underplay the difficulty of the problem that we face. In uh, An Inconvenient Truth, Al Gore uh, didn't actually say, but strongly implied that if we could get emissions down to 1990 levels, that we would get the climate and uh, atmospheric concentrations of carbon dioxide down to 1990 levels. Uh-uh, there's been a whole lot emitted between 1990 and now. And getting that carbon out of the atmosphere, that's a really hard problem, which we haven't figured out how to solve yet. So this is um, an enormous challenge. And I worry a little bit about the degree to which um, those trying to motivate action underplay how, um, how difficult it actually will be. I think it's important to be honest about the, the public costs of taking action. Another question. I think in your discussion of uh, range of confidence in relation to percentage of success, there are other factors to bring about and to question and to quantify. How would you quantify other factors, motivation, tenacity, um, skill set? There are just a number of different factors that come into play in relation to success. How would you quantify those? How would you interact those factors with relation to confidence? Uh, your question is a good one with, with a, a number of different components. So uh, a, a few thoughts. Um, one comes from a professor at London Business School who's written about uh, confidence. And he notes how easy it is to confuse um, the influence of confidence and competence. All around us, we see that more confident Politicians win, uh, more confident business people succeed, more confident athletes are victorious. Is it their confidence that helped them? Maybe. The problem is, in the real world, we don't get experiments that allow us to cleanly identify the cause. So if we observe confidence and success, What's less obvious to us is the ability that no doubt influences confidence. The most capable athletes and the business people with the best ideas will be the most confident, and they will also be more likely to succeed. So to what degree can ability account for this relationship? And maybe this link is weaker than we assume it is based on superficial observation. In an attempt to test some of these ideas, um, I've run a bunch of experiments in which I try to manipulate confidence and observe its effect on subsequent performance. This is research with uh, Jen Log, a doctoral student from Haas who recently accepted a faculty position at Georgetown, and Liz Tenney, who was a postdoc here um, and is now an assistant professor at the University of Utah. Um, in our work together, we um, manipulated confidence on lots of different tasks, tasks inspired by feedback from our participants. We asked them, where is confidence most likely to be helpful for performance? And they gave us some answers that we found it difficult to implement in the lab, like people who said it would make you a better lover. Uh, <laughs> but on other things, they said that it'd help you on a math test. So we gave our participants a math test, and half of them we made confident by telling them, you're going to do great on this test. Go to it. And the other half, we said, eh. Turned out our, our attempts to manipulate confidence had no effect on their actual performance, even though our participants, both those who experienced the experimental treatment and those who were just told about it, were willing to bet on the more confident being more successful. Now, um, that's not to say that confidence can never help. Um, in my book, I write about this moving passage from uh, a book by William James, the widely regarded as the father of modern psychology, where he writes about, uh, he, he imagines a circumstance in which he um, is faced with a challenge. He writes about a, a chasm that he has to jump in order to extricate himself from a, a mountaintop where he has, has gone hiking. And he imagines that confidence might help him get across, and that doubting might lead him to fall. And he said, in such a circumstance, believing in myself is the only wise course of action if it helps me get across. 
OK, so how much does that confidence help? If you believe you can make the leap, does it help you jump an additional foot or two, maybe? But believing that you can leap a 40-foot chasm and falling to your death is not a good decision, however inspiring the faith it displays in your own abilities. There's a, another question up here. Yeah. Um, I wonder what you think of uh, like those crowdsourcing decision making, like Ray Dalio's um, Bridgewater. They track life, everyone's decision, and keep track whether they're right most of the time, so overconfident and underestimate, and then merge some um, decision together, weight, weight their decisions together. Like, what do you think of those systems? Um, I think that there's a lot to be said for crowdsourcing and the wisdom of the crowd. You mentioned Bridgewater Associates, by some measures the world's most successful hedge fund. It is also a case study in my class. So we talk a lot about Bridgewater Associates and the unique culture of the place in which people are encouraged to respectfully disagree with one another in a way that is intended to undermine the natural human tendency toward overconfidence. Because when you're placing billion dollar bets on market outcomes, it pays to be well calibrated. So how does the wisdom of the crowd play in? Um, Bridgewater Associates attempts to employ the wisdom of the crowd by aggregating uh, forecasts or predictions by a number of smart associates there and tracking their performance. That is very, very useful, especially for um, identifying the posers and the shysters who pose as confident but who actually lack the ability to back it up with accurate performance. The wisdom of the crowd was essential to the success of our team in the Good Judgment Project, this uh, forecasting project that I mentioned earlier in which uh, Phil Tetlock and Barb Mellers and others and I worked to make forecasts of important geopolitical outcomes. Our performance was better than the other four teams with which we were competing, not because we managed to recruit the world expert on these obscure geopolitical questions, such as would another country exit the um, European Union, or um, when would Bashar al-Assad fall. Instead, what we benefited from was a bunch of really hardworking forecasters who each had a partial view of the truth, such that when we aggregated across them, we were able to enjoy the wisdom of the crowd. The wisdom of the crowd occurs in a circumstance where there, um, the, the truth is distributed. Lots of people have a piece of it. Each person is erroneous, is, it has some error in their estimate. But averaging across them helps average out those mistakes and strengthens the signal that's part of it. There are other questions. Can someone get her a microphone? It's okay. Thanks for your uh, lesson. It's just my personal question. Uh, I'm curious. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you have uh, uh, just Yeah. Obviously, employment interviews are a circumstance in which um, the incentives are all set up to express confidence in yourself. Certainly in the US, we're comfortable with that sort of um, confident display in a setting like, a, like an employment interview, where you're invited to toot your own horn. How well is that correlated with actual ability? Uh. Um, distressingly poorly. Um, we talk a lot about uh, human resource selection in my class, and I enthusiastically endorse the value of identifying hard to fake tests of the skills that actually make people successful in the jobs that you're hiring for. So figure out what skills you're looking for and figure out how to test those in ways that's hard to fake. 
puffing up your chest and speaking with confidence is a pretty cheap way to represent yourself well in an employment interview that does not usefully distinguish between those who are actually capable and those who are not. It is easy to be misled in job interviews. Another question. We have Microphone. one right here. Okay. Go for it. Yeah, I'm going to try to say this. Um, like when you look at today's big corporations and the competitive business world that it is, and you know, leadership comes out that you know we're going to do this, that, and the other, and they promise and that they're going to do it, and they got they they recruit the best workers, and everything goes forward, and then. They, they come up with these great ideas and then trust is broken and the workers don't quite get that piece of the pie, if you will. And then you watch these people scatter, if you will. So as time goes on, th those companies, they, they, they fall, we watch it all the time, you know, up and down and up and down. So somewhere where I'm trying to, uh, how is that changing in the, in the world of the big corporations or what, what's being put forth to, to like we, we watch Trump you know, <laughs> it was almost comical. <laughs> well, it is comical. <laughs> For some of us, I mean, we the people is what makes this company strong. So. Yeah, um, that's a tough one. That's, there's a lot there. Yeah, uh, um, I, I wish I could say I had confidence uh, that we were getting better at figuring this game out. Um, I'm, I'm not so. Yeah, I'm not so sure we are. Um, I think that all of us could be a little bit more skeptical of the claims of uh, big companies, would-be leaders, and politicians. Uh, can you back those claims up? Um, I was. Uh, deeply persuaded by some of the arguments made by um, a woman named Annie Duke. She wrote a fabulous book called Thinking in Bets, in which she describes how poker players help calibrate each other's confidence by inviting each other to bet on claims that they make. So um, this has resulted in some fairly humorous propositional betting stories. The most famous of one might be the uh, poker player, a sort of career poker player, a guy who spent his nights uh, up until 3 a.m. playing poker in the, in the big casinos in Las Vegas. Uh, he, he was very good at what he did. He was also sort of a risk junkie. Um, his poker player buddies said, uh, um, you couldn't survive life in the heartland. You don't know what ordinary people are like or how they live. And he was like, yeah, I, I, could, I could live in Des Moines. They said, $30,000 says, they said, want to bet was the response. $30,000 says, you can't stay in Des Moines for a month. He said, I'll take it. So the, then they worked out the conditions of the bet. He had to live on a particular street in Des Moines with one bar, one restaurant, and one hotel, all of which closed at 10 p.m. Uh, they found him a place on that street. He got on a plane the next morning and moved to Des Moines. Uh, a week in, he called his buddies in Las Vegas and said, I'm having a great time here. How about if I take it easy on you guys I, can, I come home now, you just pay me 15,000 bucks. <laughs> I said, not a chance, buddy. <laughs> In the end, he agreed to pay them 15,000 bucks and came home early. He could not handle life in Des Moines. Holding others accountable by inviting in some form, want to bet? Can you back that up? Is, can be useful for calibrating our own and others' confidence sometimes. Question. So I have questions on the, the question answer when you checked like the confidence and all. Did you, give the, uh, did you tell the uh, students right away whether they were right or wrong? Or if telling them right away whether they were right and wrong had a difference in how they estimated or in their performance? The students in my class? Yeah, like uh, right well, away. So I don't tell them the answer while they're taking the exam, but <laughs> afterwards I do. So I fed back to them charts like I showed you showing confidence calibration across the range. And they get better on the final exam. It's not perfect, but they get better. And that knowledge, that slightly improved calibration is enormously helpful. I think we are close to time. One last question, if there's one floating out there. Um, they have, so the question is whether I teach on, in the undergraduate program uh, as well as the graduate students. Uh, I think um, 
that uh, the dean's office is afraid of me corrupting the youth and so has not let me in the undergraduate classroom. Mostly I've been teaching MBAs and PhD students. Since that one was so short, this is the last question. How you make determinations on how, what's the formula for your calibrations? Uh, so uh, th that is a complicated question. I'll give you a brief answer and then we can talk more after. Uh, the, the short version of how to assess calibration is you compare um, confidence to accuracy. Um, if you've got a, um, a dichotomous outcome, either it happens or it doesn't, then a sample of one isn't going to be satisfying. You want a larger sample than that. And you can take multiple such instances from an individual if you've got a track record, or you can aggregate across individuals, uh, like we did in the 90% in the confidence interval game that I, that I gave you earlier. Um, if you've got a probabilistic outcome, sometimes you can assess the, the data generating function and can um, make good forecasts of the actual likelihood of of outcome, that, that's rare in, in uh, events that we actually care about. I should wrap it up there. Thank you so much for spending this time with me. This has been a joy.